Chapter Three of Matilda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel. Matilda by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Chapter Three. It was on my sixteenth birthday that my aunt received a letter from my father. I cannot describe the tumult of emotions that arose within me as I read it. It was dated from London. He had returned. I could only relieve my transports by tears, tears of unmingled joy. He had returned, and he wrote to know whether my aunt would come to London, or whether he should visit her in Scotland. How delicious to me were the words of his letter that concerned me! I cannot tell you, it said. How ardently I desire to see my Matilda! I look on her as the creature who will form the happiness of my future life. She is all that exists on earth that interests me. I can hardly prevent myself from hastening immediately to you, but I am necessarily detained a week, and I write, because if you come here I may see you somewhat sooner. I read these words with devouring eyes. I kissed them, wept over them and exclaimed, He will love me. My aunt would not undertake so long a journey, and in a fortnight we had another letter from my father. It was dated Edinburgh. He wrote that he should be with us in three days. As he approached his desire of seeing me, he said, became more and more ardent, and he felt that the moment when he should first clasp me in his arms would be the happiest of his life. How irksome were these three days to me! All sleep and appetite fled from me. I could only read and re-read his letter, and in the solitude of the woods imagine the moment of our meeting. On the eve of the third day I retired early to my room. I could not sleep, but paced all night about my chamber, and, as you may in Scotland at midsummer, watched the crimson track of the sun as it almost skirted the northern horizon. At daybreak I hastened to the woods. The hours passed on while I indulged in wild dreams that gave wings to the slothful steps of time, and beguiled my eager impatience. My father was expected at noon, but when I wished to return to meet him I found that I had lost my way. It seemed that in every attempt to find it I only became more involved in the intricacies of the woods, and the trees hid all trace by which I might be guided. I grew impatient, I wept, and wrung my hands, but still I could not discover my path. It was past two o'clock, when by a sudden turn I found myself close to the lake, near a cove where a little skiff was moored. It was not far from our house, and I saw my father and aunt walking on the lawn. I jumped into the boat, and well accustomed to such feats, I pushed it from shore, and exerted all my strength to row swiftly across. As I came, dressed in white, covered only by my tartan rachen, my hair streaming on my shoulders, and shooting across with greater speed than it could be supposed I could give to my boat, my father has often told me that I looked more like a spirit than a human maid. I approached the shore. My father held the boat. I leapt lightly out, and in a moment was in his arms. And now I began to live. All around me was changed from a dull uniformity to the brightest scene of joy and delight. The happiness I enjoyed in the company of my father far exceeded my sanguine expectations. We were for ever together and the subjects of our conversations were inexhaustible. He had passed the sixteen years of absence among nations nearly unknown to Europe. He had wandered through Persia, Arabia, and the north of India, and had penetrated among the habitations of the natives with a freedom permitted to few Europeans. His relations of their manners, his anecdotes, and descriptions of scenery, wild away delicious hours when we were tired of talking of our own plans for future life. The voice of affection was so new to me, 
that I hung with delight upon his words, when he told me what he had felt concerning me during these long years of apparent forgetfulness. "'At first, said he, I could not bear to think of my poor little girl. But afterwards, as grief wore off, and hope again revisited me, I could only turn to her, and amidst cities and deserts, her little fairy form, such as I imagined it, for ever flitted before me. The northern breeze, as it refreshed me, was sweeter and more balmy, for it seemed to carry some of your spirit along with it. I often thought that I would instantly return, and take you along with me to some fertile island, where we should live at peace for ever. As I returned, my fervent hopes were dashed by so many fears. My impatience became in the highest degree painful. I dared not think, but the sun should shine and the moon rise, not on your living form, but on your grave. But no, it is not so. I have my Matilda, my consolation, and my hope. My father was very little changed from what he described himself to be before his misfortunes. It is intercourse with civilized society. It is the disappointment of cherished hopes, the falsehood of friends, or the perpetual clash of mean passions, that changes the heart, and damps the ardour of youthful feelings. Lonely wanderings in a wild country, among people of simple or savage manners, may inure the body, but will not tame the soul, or extinguish the ardour and freshness of feeling incident to youth. The burning sun of India, and the freedom from all restraint, had rather increased the energy of his character. Before he bowed under, now he was impatient of any censure, except that of his own mind. He had seen so many customs, and witnessed so great a variety of moral creeds, that he had been obliged to form an independent one for himself, which had no relation to the peculiar notions of any one country. His early prejudices, of course, influenced his judgment in the formation of his principles, and some raw college ideas were strangely mingled with the deepest deductions of his penetrating mind. The vacuity his heart endured of any deep interest in life, during his long absence from his native country, had had a singular effect upon his ideas. There was a curious feeling of unreality attached by him to his foreign life, in comparison with the years of his youth. All the time he had passed out of England was as a dream, and all the interest of his soul, all his affections, belonged to events which had happened, and persons who had existed sixteen years before. It was strange, when you heard him talk, to see how he passed over this lapse of time, as a night of visions, while the remembrances of his youth standing separate as they did from his after-life, had lost none of their vigour. He talked of my mother, as if she had lived but a few weeks before. Not that he expressed poignant grief, but his description of her person, and his relation of all anecdotes connected with her, was thus fervent and vivid. In all this there was a strangeness that attracted and enchanted me. He was, as it were, now awakened from his long, visionary sleep, and he felt somewhat like one of the seven sleepers, or like Norger had in that sweet imitation of an eastern tale. Diana was gone, his friends were changed or dead, and now, on his wakening, I was all that he had to love on earth. How dear to me were the waters and mountains and woods of Loch Lomond, now that I had so beloved a companion for my rambles. I visited with my father every delightful spot, either on the islands, or by the side of the tree-sheltered waterfalls, every shady path, or dingle entangled with underwood and fern. My ideas were enlarged by his conversation. I felt as if I were recreated, and had all about me all the freshness and life of a new being. I was, as it were, transported since his arrival from a narrow spot of earth into a universe boundless to the imagination and the understanding. My life had been before as a pleasing country rill, never destined to leave its native fields, but when its task was fulfilled, quietly to be absorbed 
and leave no trace. Now it seemed to me to be as a various river, flowing through a fertile and lovely landscape, ever-changing and ever-beautiful. Alas! I knew not the desert it was about to reach, the rocks that would tear its waters, and the hideous scene that would be reflected in a more distorted manner in its waves. Life was then brilliant. I began to learn to hope, and what brings a more bitter despair to the heart than hope destroyed? Is it not strange that grief should quickly follow so divine a happiness? I drank of an enchanted cup, but gall was at the bottom of its long-drawn sweetness. My heart was full of deep affection, but it was calm from its very depth and fullness. I had no idea that misery could arise from love, and this lesson, that all at last must learn, was taught me in a manner few were obliged to receive it. I lament now, I must ever lament, those few short months of paradisical bliss. I disobeyed no command, I ate no apple, and yet I was ruthlessly driven from it. Alas! My companion did, and I was precipitated in his fall. But I wonder for my relation, let woe come at its appointed time. I may, at this stage of my story, still talk of happiness. Three months passed away in this delightful intercourse, when my aunt fell ill. I passed a whole month in her chamber nursing her, but her disease was mortal, and she died, leaving me for some time inconsolable. Death is so dreadful to the living. The chains of habit are so strong, even when affection does not link them, that the heart must be agonized when they break. But my father was beside me to console me and to drive away bitter memories by bright hopes. Methought that it was sweet to grieve, that he might dry my tears. Then again he distracted my thoughts from my sorrow, by comparing it with his despair when he lost my mother. Even at that time I shuddered at the picture he drew of his passions. He had the imagination of a poet, and when he described the whirlwind that then tore his feelings, he gave his words the impress of life so vividly that I believed while I trembled. I wondered how he could ever again have entered into the offices of life, after his wild thoughts seemed to have given him affinity with the unearthly. While he spoke, so tremendous were the ideas which he conveyed, that it appeared as if the human heart were far too bounded for their conception. His feelings seemed better fitted for a spirit whose habitation is the earthquake and the volcano, than for one confined to a mortal body and human lineaments. But these were merely memories. He was changed since then. He was now all love, all softness, and when I raised my eyes in wonder at him as he spoke, the smile on his lips told me that his heart was possessed by the gentlest passions. Two months after my aunt's death we removed to London, where I was led by my father to attend to deeper studies than had before occupied me. My improvement was his delight. He was with me during all my studies, and assisted or joined with me in every lesson. We saw a great deal of society, and no day passed that my father did not endeavour to embellish by some new enjoyment. The tender attachment that he bore me, and the love and veneration with which I returned it, cast a charm over every moment. The hours were slow, for each minute was employed. We lived more in one week than many do in the course of several months, and the variety and novelty of our pleasures gave zest to each. We perpetually made excursions together, and whether it were to visit beautiful scenery, or to see fine pictures, or sometimes for no object but to seek amusement as it might chance to arise, I was always happy when near my father. It was a subject of regret to me whenever we were joined by a third person. Yet if I turned with a disturbed look towards my father, his eyes fixed on me, and beaming with tenderness, 
instantly restored joy to my heart. Oh, hours of intense delight! Short as ye were, ye are made as long to me as a whole life, when looked back upon through the mist of grief, that rose immediately after, as if to shut ye from my view. Alas! ye were the last of happiness that I ever enjoyed. A few, a very few weeks, and all was destroyed. Like Psyche, I lived for a while, in an enchanted palace, amidst odours, and music, and every luxurious delight. When suddenly I was left on a barren rock, a wide ocean of despair rolled around me. Above all was black, and my eyes closed while I still inhabited a universal death. Still I would not hurry on. I would pause for ever on the recollections of these happy weeks. I would repeat every word, and how many do I remember? Record every enchantment of the fairy habitation. But no, my tale must not pause. It must be as rapid as was my fate. I can only describe, in short, although strong expressions, my precipitate and irremediable change from happiness to despair. End of chapter 3